welcome to lecture number five, Exposing the Enemies of Freedom. I want to start off with uh, a quote from a famous Chinese general and military strategist by the name of Sun Tzu. Over a thousand years ago, he wrote a book by the name of The Art of War and has been looked at for centuries now as probably the greatest military strategy book ever written. And in there, one of my favorite parts, he points out this very simple strategy for success. He says, it is said that if you know your enemies and know yourself, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. Essentially, you're undefeatable. But then he cautions us, if you do not know your enemies, but you do know yourself, you will win one and you'll lose one. It's pretty much a draw at that point. And lastly, if you do not know your enemies nor yourself, you will be imperiled, you will be defeated in every battle. So it's vital for us to understand not only ourselves, who we are, what our strengths are, and in my mind, to know yourself in this cause of liberty that we're fighting for here, is to know the principles of liberty that we're fighting for. If we're trying to restore freedom in this country, we better understand the principles of the U.S. Constitution and the, the liberty that we have inherited. That one's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And I find that there are many freedom groups out there that advocate adherence to the Constitution and studying the Constitution. But to know the enemy is something I find very rare. Very few groups out there really clearly understand and promote an understanding of the enemies of freedom. And if that's all we do is understand the principles of the Constitution, we're in this middle category, aren't we? We will win one and we'll lose one. It's kind of a draw. And unfortunately, I feel like that's largely why the freedom cause in our country has not been more effective in restoring liberty, is because we only have half of the equation here. So with that understanding, I want to go back to something I mentioned at the beginning of Lecture 4, and that is our Pledge of Allegiance to the Republic. When I pledge my allegiance to the Republic, you may recall one of the things I mentioned was that that Republic is defined by two things. It's built on the foundation of the Declaration of Independence. And then the structure that defines that republic is the U.S. Constitution. So when we pledge our allegiance to the republic, we're pledging our allegiance to those two great documents and the principles in there, the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. It's very similar to a, an oath of office that our political officials all swear to uphold the Constitution. I call it our citizen's oath of office. Now, being that that is my allegiance, my allegiance is to the Constitution and to the Declaration of Independence. Again, as I said last time, that means that my allegiance is not to any political candidate, political party, or any freedom group or anything of that nature. And even as a representative of the John Birch Society, it's not to the John Birch Society. My allegiance is to these principles. And those groups that I support, those individuals who I elect for office, I do so based on their adherence to the Constitution and to the Declaration of Independence principles. So with that understanding, again, I want you to think of your favorite political candidate, someone in the world of politics that you feel is so pure, if we could just get them in charge of where our nation's going, we'd be set right. And if I were to share with you today evidence that that's just a front with them and what they're really doing behind the scenes is just the opposite would you want to know? Would you want to know that your favorite candidate that you've felt is just up on this pedestal is really undermining liberty behind the scenes? That's one of those painful truths that we spoke of last time. You remember this quote from Patrick Henry where he says, we are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to that song of that siren until she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Clearly that's not wise to ignore the truth, is it? He goes on and says, For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I'm willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst and to provide for it. I used that quote last time because some of the things we had to cover in Lecture 4 were a painful truth to me, were difficult for me to hear and to accept. But I, I finally did take the same view that Patrick Henry does here. I am willing to know the truth, no matter how painful it is, because we must understand the enemy. We must know who they are, what they're working for, or else we will not win, as Sun Tzu pointed out. 
So with that understanding, I want to go into probably what I would consider the very first politically incorrect word, the C word, the dreaded C word. And I want you to notice how you respond when I say the word. The word is conspiracy. How does that word feel to you? The word conspiracy, I was always trained as a word you don't go into. You don't talk about conspiracies. You're crazy, you're a kook if you go into any kinds of conspiracies. Now, first of all, I want to define what a conspiracy is and what it's not. A conspiracy is simply these three things. It is two or more people working in secret toward evil ends. So if a couple of us were planning a surprise party for Gloria here, and it's secret, are we a conspiracy? I suppose that depends on what we have planned for the party, doesn't it? <laughs> but if it's toward evil ends, that would be a conspiracy. But generally, a surprise party is something that's kind and whatever else, so that would not be a conspiracy. On the other hand, if a few of us were conspiring to rob a local store or a local bank, that's two or more people working in secret toward evil ends, right? Is that a conspiracy? Yes. It is. Does that ever happen? Yeah, yes. It sure does. So you're all conspiracy theorists then, aren't you? Well, not exactly, not exactly. And I'm leading you intentionally, but there's a difference between conspiracy theory and conspiracy fact. And that's the point I wanna make right here is that it's important to understand that, that difference. Conspiracy theory is speculation. It's speculation in that we don't know for sure, but I suspect this or that. And what I want you to remember most important on this part is it's vitally important we do not spend our time promoting speculative conspiracy theories. The reason why was made very clear to me by a friend of mine who does this. They love to get into the speculative conspiracy theories and it seems like about every six months they contact me with the latest passing theory that our government's going to collapse in the next few months and it's going to be total cat catastrophe and whatever else. All these different uh, apocalyptical type predictions. And of course, they've never been right so far. But because they're constantly advocating all these speculative theories, no one trusts them. They've lost their influence in their community. You see why that's so important? We must stay away from the speculative conspiracy theory. And trust me, there's plenty of well-documented conspiracy fact. If you're interested in that type of thing, there's plenty to spend our time on that we do know. In fact, it's vital. it's vital that we understand what conspiracy fact is working against our liberties. So with that warning, we'll continue here. I want to start off with a little bit of history here, and we'll move forward in, in our little timeline. Starting in 1776, that year should ring a bell to everyone here. If, if not, maybe this picture will help. July 4th, 1776, you all remember. Great day, we celebrate Independence Day, when our brave forefathers, 56 brave men, put their signatures on the Declaration of Independence, knowing that that was signing their death warrant. This would be viewed, in the eyes of King George, as treason, punishable by a very brutal death. And they knew it. Now what they were doing on that day, I would say it comes down to these two words. They were declaring our sovereignty and independence. Now we all use the independence word in reference to it. But the reason I include the word sovereignty, what the word sovereignty means is there's no one higher. There's no higher authority for us to answer to. And the reason I bring this up is this is the main theme that we'll be discussing today is sovereignty and independence. They declared our sovereignty and independence. We are not answering to any higher power. We call our own shots. That is the principles of the Declaration of Independence at its very core. We are independent. We are self-governing. There is no higher power we have to answer to. And so typically the enemies of freedom are working at that root. They're working at undermining our sovereignty, our independence to rule ourselves. For example, perhaps coincidentally, also in 1776. May 1st, 1776 is a very key day to be aware of on the other side of this issue, on the side of enemies of freedom. 
This man, a man by the name of Adam, and if you're German, you'd say it Weishaupt, or Americans usually call him just Weishaupt. Adam Weishaupt created the Bavarian order of the Illuminati on May 1st of 1776. Now, the Illuminati is one of those topics that I also must caution you on. If you did a little bit of an internet search, trying to learn about the Illuminati, chances are you will find far more fiction and speculative conspiracy theory than you will find fact. Whether that's intentional or not, I don't know. But it is difficult to sort the fiction from the fact when it comes to the Illuminati. For that reason, I will go through some of what we truly do know and point in the direction of some good sources. Because the Illuminati has been labeled as many different things. My favorite speculative conspiracy theory, which I do not believe, <laughs> just so you know. I don't believe this one, but if you search on the internet long enough, you will run across the theory that the Illuminati is an alien race from the planet Draco. They're reptiles, cold-blooded, and they shapeshift to look human. They've come here to Earth to take over the world. Now, I have a hard time believing that one, and so it's vitally important that we stick with what we really do know, and there's plenty here. For example, this is some of their stated objectives, this list here. And I want you to briefly note this list. Starting with the top one, their goal to overthrow all governments of the world. Destroy all religions, mandatory atheism worldwide. Abolish the ownership of private property. And glorify sensuality, immorality. Repudiate marriage. There should be no marriage left in the world. And the state would raise children. There would be no parental role. And lastly, the goal of world government. Now, if they're a secret organization, how do we know all this about them? The story behind that's very interesting. Adam Weishaupt began using, he actually began infiltrating the Masonic lodges of Europe and using their recruiting grounds as his recruiting grounds to find those that could be loyal to his cause. And he used those Masonic lodges to jockey for positions of power in the various governments of Europe and began to try to destabilize the governments of Europe. In fact, if you were, I'm told by a French ex exchange student, if you attended the public schools in France, you would learn all about the history of the Illuminati. Over here in America, it's just a crazy conspiracy theory, right? But over in France, they're taught about how the Illuminati actually led to the French Revolution. That was their intention to destabilize the governments, to overthrow it, to put their own people in power. That was the source of the French Revolution. Very interesting. Now, as he was orchestrating this all over Europe with all these different cells throughout the Masonic lodges there, one day, one of his couriers transporting his directions back and forth between different cells, riding his horse in a lightning storm, was struck by lightning and killed. And all the documentation that was on his person fell into the authorities' hands and it exposed their, their, their conspiracy. And that's how we found out about what they were trying to do. In fact, this book in the bottom left corner here, I'm sure you can all read that, it says, Proofs of a Conspiracy. It's published by John Robeson in the year 1798. And still today, the John Birch Society continues to publish that and make it available. In that book, that was written as a warning to the world. They tried to root out this Illuminati as much as they could, but they knew they didn't get them all. And this conspiracy continued. So as a way to thwart their plans, some books were published, including this one, to expose their plans to the world. Now, as a quick side note, yet another speculative theory I want to warn you against is because Mr. Weishaupt used the Masonic lodges of Europe to promote the Illuminati does not mean that all Masons are part of an Illuminati organization. In fact, there's a European branch of the Masonic order, which is a separate branch from the British, Scottish Rite, and the American. And we don't have any well-documented evidence showing that they ever chose to use that same strategy with the British and American branches of the, of the Masonic Order. So I want to steer you away from that. Many great patriots are part of the Masonic Order, and there's no reason to, to suspect them. Okay, so moving forward, this book did start to get the information about the Illuminati out to the public. In fact, George Washington was sent a copy right around the year 1800. A friend sent it to him, asked him about it, and he 
responded saying, yes, I'm familiar with this. Here's some of what he said. He said, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati. Notice the words, nefarious and dangerous. That sounds like he doesn't like them, right? <laughs> nefarious is very evil and dangerous. Okay. He goes on to say, it was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati and the principles of Jacobinism, which is another name for them, had not spread to the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact as I am. What he's saying is, I am convinced that the Illuminati has made headway in the United States. I have no doubts of that. He had seen it in his day. As a high-ranking Mason, he also made that comment that uh, he saw no evidence that they were using the same strategy in the United States through the Masonic Lodges. So with that, that is the foundation of the Illuminati, an ancient conspiracy starting in 1776. The points that they were pushing for, I hope you remember, because they come back again. Here's some of the other things that he, he said was their objectives. Plan to overturn all governments, all religion, even natural, and they endeavor to eradicate every idea of a supreme being and distinguish man from beast by his shape only. What does that sound like to you? That man is just another animal, he's really no different. Sounds like the theories of evolution, Darwinism, and so on. Well, this certainly preceded Darwin by quite some time, but his theories fit in their agenda very well. Now, fast forward to the year 1847. A branch of the Illuminati, known as the League of Just Men, hired Karl Marx. You might have heard of Karl Marx before. Hired him to write the Communist Manifesto. And they asked him to have it ready for publication by January of 1848 so that they could get it out in February of 1848. Their plan was, and this might sound like lecture one to you a little bit, their plan was to start democratic revolutions all over Europe and to have the release of the Communist Manifesto be the answer to all these revolutions. That as they create these revolutions of the common people, it would lead them to embracing the Communist Manifesto. That was their objective. And that's an objective, a strategy, that communists have used ever since to try to destabilize and create grassroots movements of revolutions, democratic revolutions. You remember from lecture number one, we talked about Mao Zedong saying the democratic revolution is the necessary precursor to a socialist revolution. And a socialist revolution is the inevitable sequel. And so that is exactly what they were doing in 1848. It didn't work out as well as planned. But here are some of the key points that he highlights in the Communist Manifesto. They should look a little familiar. Abolition of private property. Well, that was definitely one of the tenets of the Illuminati. A heavy progressive or graduated income tax as a method of getting the property from the people. Centralized national bank with an exclusive monopoly. In lecture number three, we showed clearly how that is a great way of, again, taking a major part of the people's wealth. Abolish home education and replace with mandatory government schools. Again, replacing the parent's role with the state raising the children. Abolishing marriage and family structure, eliminate countries, eliminate religion, promote democracy, and establish world government. Quite a list of objectives. The reason I show those again is it's interesting to see who's promoting those today. We'll come to that in a moment. But as I was reading the Communist Manifesto for the first time a few years ago, it occurred to me that if you were to take the Ten Commandments and then list next to it, what the Communist Manifesto has to say on that topic, every case, it's exactly the opposite. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, you shall have no god at all. And honor thy father and thy mother, the role of parents is completely eliminated, and so on. Try that sometime. Go through all ten of the Ten Commandments, and then as you study the Communist Manifesto, you'll find it's directly opposing it. So if, if that is truly from God, it gives you some idea of what source this might be from. Now, we're going to jump back and forth in history for just a moment. I want to demonstrate to you some things that have happened and then show you part of how it happened. So as you jump into 1942 to 1945, we have at that time period World War II. 
and you might recognize some of the people here. Over on the right hand side we have Jimmy Doolittle and his crew. They were some of the brave men that took on a very dangerous task and that was to fly bombers out over Tokyo to bomb Tokyo and then because they couldn't land their bombers back on the aircraft carriers they'd taken from, they were instructed to continue on over mainland China, which was occupied by the Japanese, and to take your planes as far as the fuel will take you and then abandon and try to find your way back to safety. And so Jimmy Doolittle and his crew and many other crews that did similar bombing raids landed in Japanese-occupied China behind enemy lines. Now the man on the left here, his name is Captain John Birch. He's the one who the John Birch Society is actually named after. He's not the one that founded it. John Birch was a Christian missionary in China at this time. And some of the locals who were loyal to the Americans and against the Japanese found Jimmy Doolittle and hid him from the Japanese. So they brought John Birch to meet Jimmy Doolittle and his crew, and John Birch did rescue them. Because of his familiarity with backcountry, he was able to sneak them out from behind enemy lines and rescue them. Upon discovering that there were many other crews that were also stranded, he went back in, and all that were not killed or captured, he was able to rescue, and he became a war hero. Now, at this time in, in China, there were two men that were really vying for power over the future of China. Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. And if you believe the mainstream media in the United States at the time, Mao Zedong is not a communist. He's just an agrarian reformer. It's just a people's movement trying to get more rights for the people. He's not a communist. He's our ally. Chiang Kai-shek, on the other hand, was somewhat demonized. And interestingly, Chiang Kai-shek had become a Christian and a constitutionalist. He was, he had actually looked over the United States Constitution and drafted a similar constitution for China, wanting to create China as a constitutional republic. Now, the American ambassador to China, upon meeting both of them, felt that we would certainly want to back Chiang Kai-shek and support his efforts to lead the future of China against, clearly, who was really a communist, Mao Zedong. In the end, we promised him armaments and never delivered them. Now, Mao Zedong, on the other hand, we gave him everything we had there as we pulled out. All of our tanks and munitions and everything we had in, in China went into the hands of Mao Zedong, leaving Chiang Kai-shek unarmed and Mao Zedong very well armed and easily positioned to take over China. So interestingly, our foreign policy helped China fall into the hands of communism. Now the other part of the story is that John Birch, about 10 days after the war was over, he was there working with the U.S. Army, he was now Captain John Birch, and he fell into the hands of the Chinese communists, Mao Zedong's people, and they brutally murdered him on the spot, recognizing him as a threat to their cause. The truth of his death was covered up. It was actually classified information. If an American hero had hit the headlines as having been murdered by what was supposed to be our ally. That would have painted Mao Zedong as a very different figure than the media had portrayed him as up until that point. Would have greatly undermined their efforts to help him come to power. So it was covered up. It wasn't until about a decade later that a member of US Congress discovered the secret files of John Birch and blew the lid off of it. Two great books on the topic. The Secret File of John Birch, and then The Life of John Birch. This one happens to be written by Robert Welch, who is the founder of the John Birch Society. He was a big fan of John Birch and received permission from his parents to name this organization after him. Now, another interesting part right here. Notice Saturday Evening Post, 1955, so about a decade later, when the story of John Birch was finally exposed to the world, they wrote this very honest opinion. It says, Amazingly, there were in Washington responsible officials who were willing to suppress news of the murder of an American officer, apparently to prevent the American people from rising in their wrath and vetoing further appeasement of communism. The point is, why did they cover up the death of John Birch? So that we would continue appeasing communism, allowing Mao Zedong to come to power. 
very interesting. Next, I want to go back in time a little bit to show you some of how this came to be. How were there people in Washington that were appeasing communism? Very clearly. In this year, 1913, we have two men on the scene here. You might recognize President Woodrow Wilson. But the man to his, to his right, far less known, but he really should be a prominent man in American history. His name is Colonel, though he was never a colonel, <laughs> honorary title, Colonel Edward Mandel House. And Colonel House really was the president's puppeteer, you could say, the one who ran the presidency during the Wilson administration. Woodrow Wilson openly admitted, no two men have ever thought as alike as we. He's my alter ego, my other self. He said that this was the man that he spoke to first thing in the morning, last thing at night, and at every decision throughout the day. If there ever was a presidency being run behind the scenes, this was one of them. Now, who was this Mr. House, and what was his objectives, his agenda? Fortunately, he wrote a book for us that clearly outlines what he wanted to do. The book was called Philip Drew, Administrator. It's a rather poor written novel, actually. But in this novel, Philip Drew, the hero, represents Mr. House. And in there, he des describes how he would control, he would manufacture and control a president. He showed us plans for a League of Nations that almost exactly mirrored the actual League of Nations proposal that Woodrow Wilson proposed a few years later. But most notably, he declared his primary objective was to pursue socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. So put very succinctly, Mr. House is a Marxist. He's a socialist, a communist, whatever you want to call it. And he was pursuing socialism, pursuing Marxism. Here are some of the things he also sought to do. For example, the Wilson administration passed the 16th Amendment in 1913. 16th Amendment was the excuse for our heavy progressive income tax, which happens to be communist plank Communist Manifesto, plank number two. They also implemented the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, which is Communist Manifesto, plank number five. And the 17th Amendment, which removed the power of the state legislature to check federal usurpation of power. Our state legislature used to appoint U.S. Senators. U.S. Senators were accountable to the state government from which they came. The reason that's important is if the federal government is to steal power they were not given. According to the Tenth Amendment, all powers not given by the Constitution to the federal government were reserved to the states or to the people. So if they're taking power, they're either taking it from the states or the people. The purpose of U.S. Senators prior to the 17th Amendment was to make sure that the federal government didn't steal state power. Since 1913, they've had no one there keeping an eye on that. And the federal government has taken a tremendous amount of power from the states, where today the states feel like they just have to do whatever the federal government tells them. Very much reversed from the original system. Speaking against the establishment of the Federal Reserve, Charles A. Lindbergh Sr., father of the famous aviator, declared that this act, the Federal Reserve Act, establishes the most gigantic trust, meaning money trust or monetary power, the most gigantic trust on earth. When the president signs the bill, the invisible government of a monetary power will be legalized. The worst legislative crime of the ages is perpetrated by this banking and currency bill. Do you suppose we need to look back through the history and see which way he voted on it? <laughs> I think it's pretty clear he was very much against the Federal Reserve Act, feeling like it would create invisible government. It create a power behind the scenes that would be very dangerous. One other thing we touched on, the history of inflation before the Federal Reserve. One of the propaganda of why we have to pass this Federal Reserve Act was the out of control inflation up until 1913. Here we have 250 years of inflation with a little blip every once in a while when we go to war. Now, out of control inflation leads to, here we go, with this is inflation that's now under control shooting straight up. Inflation under control for whose benefit? For theirs, not ours. One other thing I pointed out was the TARP bill, as you may remember, which was passed by U.S. Congress as $850 billion. 
before Congress even passed the TARP bill, I noted on the Federal Reserve's reporting website, the monetary base had just increased by about 900 billion. The week that Congress said no to the first version of the TARP bill, they were still working out the details. In other words, the Federal Reserve looked like they were moving ahead with the TARP bill, whether or not it was going to pass. And due to the partial audit that occurred back in early of 2011, we discovered that not only did they do this, but they've also, under the table, been sending trillions of dollars to U.S. and foreign banks in the uh, form of additional bailouts, over $16 trillion of additional bailouts that were never authorized by Congress. Just some examples of the power that Mr. Lord Mayor Amschel Rothschild refers to. Let us control the money of a nation, and we care not who makes its laws. It's what I call the other golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. So, just as a brief review of some of our past lectures, first of all, this statement from Nikita Khrushchev, when he came to America to learn about our agriculture from Ezra Taft Benson, he told Mr. Benson that your children will live under communism. And Benson's reply was, oh no, we will do everything we can to fight you and to keep from our country falling into communism. Khrushchev responds, you Americans are so gullible. No, you won't accept communism outright, but we'll keep feeding you small doses of socialism until you finally wake up and find you already have communism. We won't have to fight you. We'll so weaken your economy until you fall like overripe fruit into our hands. And so what we've covered in the last four lectures is various ways in which they do exactly that, to weaken our economy. You remember the dangers of democracy. The democracies always fail due to loose fiscal policy. The quote from Alexander Teitler from the book, where he says that democracies never last long. They last until the people recognize they can vote themselves money from the public treasury at which point they always then vote for the candidate who promises the most benefits, money, from the public treasury, resulting in the fact that democracies always collapse to loose fiscal policy. They spend themselves into collapse. Look at Europe today, that's exactly what has happened. Europe is on the brink of financial ruin because they adopted democracy, which led to socialism, which is leading to their financial collapse. We covered in lecture two how through creative interpretation of the Constitution, interpretations that were never intended by those who wrote it, they found supposedly unlimited power in the General Welfare Clause, or the Interstate Commerce Clause, or the Necessary and Proper Clause, and how by truly adhering to what is clearly the original intent of the Constitution, our federal government would be only about 20% its size of what it is today. But by getting the Constitution out of the way, we're again moving towards unlimited government, helping fulfill the vision of Khrushchev there. Lecture three, we went into the dangers of the Federal Reserve, which really works like an unlimited credit card for government spending. Great way to create greater and greater amounts of inflation and hyperinflation, greater amounts of debt. And then lastly, we went through, in lecture four, constitutional war powers, and the way the neoconservatives use the war powers, which not only further impoverishes our nation, but also is a way of controlling foreign countries and sacrificing our rights on the home front. So with that, all of these working together really do help them, as he says there, weaken our economy until we fall like ripe fruit into their hands. And as you look through the Communist Manifesto today, we have implemented a great amount of it. This brings us to the quote at the bottom from economist Henry Hazlitt. He's one of the economists that we would call an Austrian school of economics, not the Keynesian style. He warns of the dangers of inflation. He says, inflation tears apart the whole fabric of stable economic relationships. It drives men toward desperate remedies. It leads men to demand totalitarian controls. It ends invariably in bitter disillusion and collapse. Think about the Weimar Republic. Probably the most notable thing we remember from that is their hyperinflation, where people would take barrels full of money to buy small, small items. There's the story of a man bringing a wheelbarrow to the marketplace, parking it out front, going in, doing his shopping, and comes out and finds he was robbed, not of the money, but of the wheelbarrow. The pile of money was still there. 
Obviously, the wheelbarrow was more valuable. But from that Weimar Republic, it led men to demand totalitarian controls in the form of electing Adolf Hitler. He was elected to power by the people who were demanding totalitarian controls, desperate remedies, as he speaks of there. You can see why Khrushchev knew what he was talking about here, that if we can weaken your economy enough, we, the American people, will demand totalitarian controls. We'll be willing to give up our liberties for someone to save us. Now, one of the objectives of the Wilson administration and of Mr. House that wasn't realized was the establishment of the League of Nations, which would be, had it been implemented, to a degree, a world governing body. The Senate was wise to not ratify that. So in place of that, in 1921, he and a group of others started this organization known as the Council on Foreign Relations. And their objective, we'll go into very clearly here in the next few slides, a little bit more from the perspective of who the Council on Foreign Relations is. Carol Quigley, he was a mentor to Bill Clinton. And in his book, he talks about the Council on Foreign Relations. It is an American branch of a society which originated in England and believes national boundaries should be obliterated and one world rule established. Does that sound familiar? We've found a few groups throughout the years that believe in that very thing, from Weishaupt's Illuminati, Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, all promote this very same thing. I went onto their website a few years ago, and this is one of their claims to fame they had right on the front of their website. It says, through its membership, meetings, and studies, it has been called the most powerful agent of the United States foreign policy outside the State Department. Now, they're saying outside the State Department. I disagree with that one word, outside. Because over the last several decades, every U.S. Secretary of State has either been a member or at least a close affiliate like Hillary Clinton of the Council on Foreign Relations. Hillary herself is not a member, though her husband is. And she clearly declared where she's getting her marching orders from. Every Secretary of State for decades has been following their, their direction. And so I would say outside and inside the State Department. And that's largely why we've had so many very bizarre things coming from the State Department that has been harmful to our foreign policy, such as appeasing of Mao Zedong and helping him come to power. Now, Admiral Chester Ward is one who was a member of the Council on Foreign Relations for about 16 years before he really got an idea of what they were about and resigned in disgust. Began speaking out against them and exposing them. This one he says in this three-part quote, once the ruling members of the CFR have decided that the U.S. government should adopt a particular policy, the very substantial research facilities of the CFR are put to work to develop arguments intellectual and emotional, to support the new policy. And to confound and discredit intellectually and politically any opposition. You've probably seen some of that. For example, I know a, a man who's a climate physicist who has mountains of evidence against the theories of global warming. And yet he is constantly confounded and discredited by the media. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear his evidence. They just want to shut them down because they don't want anything contrary to their stated objectives being published. You see similar things with anyone that provides evidence that's contrary to the theories of evolution. There's a great book on that topic called Tornado in a Junkyard that shows mountains of evidence that there are huge holes in the theories of Darwin. Much of the quotes in there are Darwin himself admitting that. Again, that was Tornado in a Junkyard, written by James Perloff. Now, on the topic of global climate change, Richard N. Haas, president of the CFR, declares, some governments are prepared to give up elements of their sovereignty, their independence, to address the threat of global climate change. This shows clearly why they're so interested in this global warming agenda, despite the fact that about every 30 years for the last century, the climate alarmists have changed their tune. That about every 30 years, it's the coming ice age, and then 30 years later, it's coming global warming, and then coming ice age, and they keep going back and forth. In fact, lately, I just saw a few headlines saying, the glaciers are increasing in size. And the temperatures we've seen over the last decade have actually been declining. So we're probably about due for another shift in their claims. 
get ready for the claims of a coming ice age again. <laughs> you may remember a few years ago, this would be uh, about 2009, there was this great summit happening, the Climate Environmentalist Summit in Copenhagen, pursuing what they called the Copenhagen Treaty. And this organization, Socialists International, had a very strong presence at this international convention. And here's what they felt was the objective of the Copenhagen Treaty. George Papandandrew, president of Socialist International and also the Prime Minister of Greece, says, at this time we are observing the birth of global governance. As we come together in this treaty for how to address climate change, it will birth global governance. Incidentally, on a side note of who the Socialist International is, this is their open statement to the world. The ultimate objective of the parties of the Socialist International is nothing less than world government. Membership of the United Nations must be made universal. Richard N. Gardner wrote an article in the Foreign Affairs Magazine, that's the publication from the CFR, back in 1974. It's called The Hard Road to World Order. In then there he advised an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. You've got to erode it through the back door. This, that's exactly what we're seeing them doing through many different means. One of my favorite examples of that is the Agenda 21 objectives, that we can destroy your property rights secretly and through the back door in ways that you wouldn't recognize as a frontal assault. Two great publications on the topic. We have an article from our New American magazine called Council on Foreign Relations. If you go to the website, thenewamerican.com, you can look this one up. Also, an excellent book I highly recommend, The Shadows of Power. It's a U.S. history book that should be required reading for every student. It goes through the last hundred years of our foreign policy. It clearly demonstrates how not only did our foreign policy lead to communism rising in China, but also in Russia and in Cuba, and anywhere that any form of Marxism has taken root, whether it's socialism or communism or whatever, our foreign policy has been there to help it happen due to their influence on our State Department and many times the office of the President. It's not easy reading in that uh, it's sometimes a little hard to take. It's some of those painful truths that we need to be aware of, but it should be required reading, absolutely. That's, that can be purchased on our website, shopjbs.org. Org. Now again, going back to Carol Quigley, you may remember I mentioned this one in Lecture 4, he says the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shift in policy. In Lecture 4 we compared a little bit of the policy of Bush and Obama. The President Bush, though he pursued the warfare objective more so than Obama is, Bush also did expand the welfare front as well. Obama, though he hasn't changed directions, he's just changed focus. He's focusing more on the welfare state and a little less on the warfare state, though he's expanding that as well. The two parties aren't that much different. There's no significant change in direction here. Now, if you're not wanting to read his entire book, The Tragedy and Hope, which is about 1,400 pages, a concise version of it was published by Cleon Skousen. He's the author of The 5,000-Year Leap. This is known as The Naked Capitalist. And in there, he goes through and really gives you the highlights, or lowlights as it may be, from the, uh, from the book Tragedy and Hope. At the beginning of The Naked Capitalist, he shares a story about this lady. Her name is Dr. Bella Dodd. Very, very illuminating, I guess you could say. She was one of the top leaders of the Communist Party USA, and she was getting her marching orders directly from Moscow. Now, at one time, she found that at a crucial decision-making time, she was not able to connect with Moscow and get her directions and had to just make do. Once she got back in touch with Moscow, she asked them, what should I do in the future if I have a crucial decision to make and cannot connect with you? They gave her an address at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York and said, any of these three men can give you direction. And what she was shocked to learn was that the men at this hotel were not Russians and they were not communists. These were three men who she looked at as the enemy. These were the American capitalist leaders. 
we're talking about people like Morgan and Rothschild and so on. And what she later discovered was they're not getting their marching orders from Moscow either. Moscow is getting their marching orders from these men. At which point she quit the Communist Party, deciding that uh, there's something much deeper behind it. In fact, she said, I think the Communist conspiracy is merely a branch of a much bigger conspiracy. And she no longer wanted anything to do with it. Very interesting. So moving forward to 1945, we have the establishment of the United Nations. Now it should be noted that two men worked together in drafting the charter for the United Nations. There was a delegate from Russia, who of course we all knew was a communist. But we thought this was a good thing because he was working side by side with an American who would give the freedom perspective. Unfortunately, that American was Alger Hiss, who was later discovered to be a communist spy. So we had two communists working together drafting the United Nations Charter. One of my favorite parts to point out that very few people know is that the United Nations, while they do talk extensively about the importance of your rights, if you look at their UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they openly declare that rights and freedoms may in no case be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. That means you can have your rights as long as they don't get in our way. I pointed out in a previous lecture that that's exactly the opposite of what our Declaration of Independence says, that our rights are unalienable. In this case, your rights are subject to our approval. Very contrary to the principles of our nation. Another State Department crime, you could say. Back in 1962, Lincoln P. Bloomfield wrote a policy manual for the U.S. State Department called A World Effectively Controlled by the United Nations. This is their plan for how to get us completely subject, subservient rather than sovereign. The very introduction, the first paragraph, gives you a good idea of what it contains. It says, a world effectively controlled by the United Nations is one which world government would come about through the establishment of supranational institutions. Supranational means outside of country boundaries. Characterized by mandatory universal membership. You must be a member whether you want to or not. And some ability to employ physical force so that you can be forced into membership. What would that be? That would be military force we're talking about there. Effective control would thus entail a preponderance, a massive amount of political power in the hands of supranational organization rather than in individual units and would assume the effective operation of a general disarmament agreement. The countries must disarm at the same time as we create this ability to employ physical force on the international level. Now this isn't the only time the State Department has published this type of a document. The year before, 61, this document called Freedom from War, published by the U.S. State Department. The subtitle, The United States Program for General and Complete Disarmament in a Peaceful World. At the bottom I've given you a little excerpt from it. It says, the Freedom from War prescribes progressive controlled disarmament of all nations of the world to a point where no state, meaning no nation, would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened UN Peace Force. The most powerful military in the world should be the United Nations, and no country would have the ability to, to resist them. That's the plan. All in favor? No, thank you. <laughs> in addition to that, if you're ever wondering what the United Nations position is on our Second Amendment and our right to bear arms, they have this statue out in the front of their, their building in the U.S. headquarters, which you, know, you might think that's just a new design for how to shoot around corners. But I think it means much more than that, doesn't it? Another great book on the topic, The Global Gun Grab, which shows clearly the United Nations campaign to disarm America. They clearly want us disarmed. You remember from lecture number four, I had a quote on the topic from Mao Zedong where he says, political power comes from the barrel of a gun. They clearly want that political power in their hands, not in ours. So today, who are the enemies? of freedom. And while I'd have to say everyone on this page 
has worked against the freedom of mankind. I'd say if I was to pick one that was the worst enemy of freedom, I'd say it would be David Rockefeller. I'll let him speak for himself on this matter. He says that some even believe that we are part of a secret cabal, a secret society, conspiracy, working against the best interests of the United States. He's speaking of we, meaning his family, the Rockefeller family. And he says that we, myself, for example, characterize my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure, one world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I'm proud of it. What's he admitting to here? He's admitting to being a conspirator. He's conspiring. He admits he's working against the best interests of the United States. He admits he's working towards globalism. I don't need to accuse him of it. He's admitting it. So who do we trust? We've clearly shown that uh, there's a lot going on behind the scenes that I wasn't aware of beforehand. Many different media sources that really are controlled. Most any major media source is. Many of our political candidates are espousing platforms that are contrary to the principles of liberty and hostile to the Constitution. Who do we trust? My advice to you is don't trust anybody blindly. Verify everyone. Whatever they say, we need to first understand the Constitution ourselves so that when we see someone from whatever political party or from any media source espousing principles that are contrary to it, we see through them. Because if we just simply find someone that we're going to trust blindly, they have the potential to lead us astray. It's important that we know for ourselves. Now, how can we win? After showing the doom and gloom of just how powerful the enemy really is, and that's vital in order for us to win, how can we win at this point? One of my favorite and most encouraging statements I've heard comes from Arthur Thompson. He's the CEO of the John Birch Society. A couple of years ago, he said this, it costs a great deal more money to lie to the people and organizing them into enslaving themselves than it does to tell the truth. It probably takes one dollar for every thousand dollars the insiders spend to undo insider propagated falsehoods with truth. Sometimes the ratio is even greater. That's very encouraging. And I can attest to that. I've seen many examples of where just a dollar here or there of truth can undo thousands of dollars of propaganda. In fact, I'll give you one brief example. There was a young lady I met just a few years ago who had graduated from college in Missoula, Montana. And she admits when she graduated from college, she was a committed liberal, probably borderline socialist. Her uncle gave her a gift subscription to our magazine, The New American. She began reading it, and after two years of reading the magazine, she was completely changed. She called our headquarters saying, how can I get involved in the fight for defending the Constitution? She became a constitutionalist. She said to me, prior to reading The New American, I never knew there was another option. She'd always been taught big government solutions, even if it was the big government liberal solution versus the big government conservative solution, but never shown the constitutional perspective. And when she saw it, it made sense. And it really melted away the lies and propaganda that she'd been fed throughout her schooling. Another quick example. Some of you may be familiar with the Security and Prosperity Partnership of North America. This was signed by President George Bush just two months after being sworn into his second term as president, March 23, 2005. And this agreement with Prime Minister Paul Martin of Canada and Mexican Pre President Vincente Fox agreed that by the year 2010, January 31st, 2010, that we would no longer secure the borders between our nations in any way we'd only secure the border of North America, and that passing from Mexico into the United States into Canada would be no different than passing from Idaho into Montana. Now, clearly they didn't hit that objective. We, had, we do have hardly any border security, but they still pretend at least to some degree. How did we stop them from achieving that goal? And here's how. First of all, our magazine came out with this issue 
a very special edition called the North American Union Edition, Merger in the Making. And in this magazine, every article in there shows various evidence of their plans to create a merger of the United States, Mexico, and Canada, exposing their plans. The most effective way to dis destroy a conspiracy is to expose them. They're like roaches. You turn on the light, they flee. We set a goal that was published in our bulletin, which is a member's publication, out to all the members across the country to get a million copies of this magazine to the hands of our elected officials at every level across the country. A million copies into U.S. congressmen, state legislators, governors, county commissioners, everyone in any elected position needs a copy of this to understand this agenda that is being secretly worked against us. Our goal was a million, we hit 1.2 million. We did okay. With that much light being shown on this agenda, they were put back at least a decade. It looks like now they're shooting for about, actually the year 2020, for implementing that same agenda. They're renaming it, repackaging it, trying to pass it off again. But we were able to put them back in, in their schedule. The reason I show you this is just simply to show you some of the patterns of how we can win. As we help people understand the principles of liberty and as we expose the enemy's plans, we win. It's really very simple. It brings me back to, you may remember some of these great paintings. I love the painting of George Washington there praying. The reason I bring this up is that when we were in our war for independence, the odds were tremendously against us. We had this ragtag band trying to take on the greatest military power in the world. Historians estimate that only about 3% of the population were the ones that were vigorously fighting for our freedom. Only 3%. And yet with that, we saw many great miracles that came to our aid. I'll tell just one. I, I sometimes give lectures just talking about the miracles that made America. And that could be quite a lengthy discussion because there are many. I have a friend that's writing a book where he declares there's at least 60 times where George Washington wrote back to Congress saying, yet again today, we have seen the hand of divine providence coming to our aid. The very conclusion of our war for independence was the Battle of Yorktown, where Washington and his troops laid siege to Yorktown. We had Cornwallis holed up in Yorktown. And he had just received word that reinforcements were on their way just a few days out. And so he, he could easily just bunker in and hold out until the reinforcements came. What Cornwallis decided to do instead was, they're right on the York River. We could ferry across the York River and escape. So he began doing that. And with gathering up all the boats and barges and anything they could get together, they took the first shipment across the York River. As soon as they landed, gale force winds picked up, unlike they'd ever seen before, and took all their boats and barges out to sea, leaving them with no way to continue this escape. Now, this is by far not the only example of this type of thing happening, but every time, at just the right moment, the weather changes, or something of that nature, leading to our advantage, their disadvantage. So many times that one British general was heard declaring it seems as if even the God of heaven is on Washington's side in despair. I believe he was on Washington's side. I've seen far too many examples of that. The reason I point this out is that that continues today. I've seen, again, many examples in our day where I would say clearly the God of heaven is on the side of freedom. I'll give you one example. A number of years ago when I lived in, in Idaho, there was a proposal before the state legislature to put on the ballot that coming fall an amendment to preserve the traditional definition of marriage against activist judges. They wanted to amend the state constitution so that activist judges couldn't somehow interpret our state constitution to allow same-gender marriage. Now, the people of Idaho generally very strongly supported this. I went to testify before the state legislature. I went to the House, and the House members told me, don't worry about this. It always passes the House. This is our third try. It's the Senate you need to worry about. And in the Senate, you need to worry about this one senator. There's a group of about five Republican senators that always vote with the Democrats on this. And if you get their ringleader, and they pointed out to me who he was, you get him to back down, the rest will as well. 
I went home and was pondering what we could do because if the general body of people in his district knew that he was the one stopping this marriage amendment from progressing, they wouldn't support him in that. And after pondering over this for some time, I came, with, came up with an idea. I made up these little cards that says, help defend traditional family values, and on the backside, how to contact your legislature. And it, it told what this bill was about and how to get in touch with your elected representatives. I lived in the town where this, this gentleman's district was, and I went around door by door, knocking on doors and saying, I just wanted to inform you of something that's before the state senate right now that I feel very, is very important. And wanted you to let your senator know how you feel about the matter. That's, and that's all we really did. And in the process of this, as I'd knock on doors, I'd find someone who'd say, do you have any extras of those? Well, sure, how many do you want? Well, I'll take 20. Okay, what area do you want to cover? I'll go cover these, these streets. Great, and they'd take off. And people, little by little, would volunteer to spread these for me as well. Until when it was all said and done, I accounted for at least 500 of these cards being distributed in his district. Now, what I didn't know a year later, I met a lady who did the same thing. I was covering the south half of his district. It was one of those gerrymandered districts that was very long, and I was only able to geographically reach the southern half. I met a lady that lived in the northern half of his district. She came up with a similar card. I didn't even know her. And she started passing out these cards, and she found other people standing up saying, I'll take some of those cards and distribute them as well. And about 500 of her cards got distributed. And in the end, when it came time to vote on this bill, to put it on the ballot, the same senator came up and pounded the pulpit and said, I'm still against this bill. But I have heard from over a thousand of my constituents telling me if I didn't vote for it, I would never see the inside of the state house again. And then this wonderful conclusion, he says, sometimes you have to do what your voters want. <laughs> and again, I tell you this story because I want you to understand that there truly is miracles that happen in the fight for freedom. I want to conclude with the rest of a statement from Patrick Henry. I read to you the beginning part of his speech. But he says, besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. And then he concludes this very famous speech with the part we're familiar with. Why stand we here idle? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. You can still feel the passion of that speech. That has been now handed on to us. We now have the responsibility to stand for liberty. We must first educate ourselves. We must understand the principles of liberty. And we must understand the enemies of freedom. And then from there we can work on educating our own communities. Don't worry about the whole country. All you need to do is focus on your own community, educating one here or one there as we start shifting the tide towards those that will stand for liberty. No matter how insurmountable the odds may seem, remember the odds that Washington's troops faced. It can be done. With that, thank you for joining us today.